Hi, this is Carrie Hummingbird, and this is Soul Nectar, that show that talks about essence, connection to that which is bigger than you, that deep and wide, the unknowable, that space of soul. And today, I'm so excited to share the story of Debbie Pokornik from Empowering Energy. Uh, she is a mother, natural health nut, dedicated dog owner, award-winning author, social worker, and enlightenment guide. She is the chief empowerment officer for her company, Empowering Energy, which helps women transform their relationships so that they can live a vibrant, powerful life at work, at home, and at play. She is the author of award-winning parenting books and products, as well as bestsellers, Standing in Your Power. And she's also the host of the Vibrant Powerful Moms podcast. So I'm um, really excited to have you here. I know that you are way up in uh, Manitoba with your family, uh, that you've been rumbling around the countryside in your red bus. <laughs> My big red bus. Named Merlot? <laughs> yes. Love that. Yes, it's a great bus. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, this show is a fun show because we're always, it's like we're sitting around the campfire and we're telling stories about our connection. And I know that you mentioned before when we talked that you have lots of stories of places where you were redirected and given some insight into why you're here. Um, but, you know, so just in this moment, you know, pull out what you think and feel uh, is most relevant for our audience today. I would love to. I think that um, one of the stories that really jumps out for me, um, because it's the most fun to tell, and it, it gets people sitting on the edge of their seat usually, <laughs> which is when I went uh, on a ski trip. My husband and I decided that we should take our kids for one final hurrah on the ski hill. This was back in 2010. And um, I was just about to launch my first book, Break Free of Parenting Pressures. So I had lots on the go at the time, but we decided, you know what? It's beautiful weather. We're getting an extra week of ski time. So let's go and let's have fun. And so I phoned the hill because it was getting warmer out and I wanted to make sure there was snow. And they told me, oh yeah, we'll be skiing all week. So we drove out to the ski hill and we got all set up and it got warmer and warmer. And by the time we got there, we were skiing through puddles. So we could tell that we probably were going to get one day of skiing out. We should make it good. So we played and we were just having a great time. And on the last uh, time up the chairlift, I was sitting actually with my friend and her young son. And as we went to leave, the, the guy had told us at the bottom of the hill that this is it. We're closing down. So take the run back to the uh, chalet and, and call it a day. And so my friend turned to her son and said, uh, Alex, we're going to go that way. So turn that way. And I guess he had cut her off a few times because he was so little. But anyway, I'm sitting on that side of him and I decide I'll just get right out of the way and not be part of the problem. So I spun around in my, in my chair uh, to get off of the chairlift and my jacket, which was a really nice hot pink rip zone jacket. <laughs> it, it kind of, I had tied it down around my waist because I was quite warm and it had gone through the arm. And when I did that, it kind of tied it into a knot. And oh. so suddenly I'm attached to the arm of the chairlift. Now, if you've ever been to a ski hill, you know, they stop those chairlifts all the time. They're really on the ball not this time. There was actually two people working in it in the chalet or in the shack and a third was in there to dry her mittens and none of them noticed. People were yelling, including myself, stop the lift, I'm stuck, you know, and they were busy doing something so they just weren't paying attention and so before anybody really could do anything, the chairlift had picked me up and threw me over top of the safety bar, which was my last chance to stop the chairlift, dragged me across this big net that was like over 20 feet over the ground, that's why the net is there, and passed the final bar and was starting its descent down a black diamond run. And I'm hanging <laughs> from this chairlift with my jacket, my hot pink jacket tied around my waist. And, and um, finally they stopped the lift just before, um, you know, the, the run kind of goes out and then whew, way down and it was just before it went way down and so now I'm hanging there my arms are just stretched out because I tried to stop it 
right? You don't think that, I mean, I knew the chairlift was too strong for me, but I did everything I could to either rip my jacket or um, stop the chairlift and uh, it's to no avail. So now my arms were aching, I'm hanging there and I'm about 25 feet or so off the ground. And I can hear that I can see the guy on the phone radioing somebody and talking to somebody. And I can hear the comments and I can hear people saying, well, back it up then. Move it forwards. Does anybody have a rope? There's got to be something. And I thought, oh my gosh, they don't have a plan for this. Mm. And so really it was just my husband who I, I heard him come under me under the, the ski lift. And I heard him go, Debbie, I'm, I'm here. And I'm like, great, what do I do? You know, I can't hold on much longer. And uh, after a few minutes of listening to these people banter, I heard my husband say, I think you're going to have to get yourself down. And I'm like, how? Anyway, to make a long story short, I, I did let go uh, on purpose. I didn't actually slip, which amazed me because I had hung on for a couple minutes, which is a long time. If you did the flex arm hang in school, you know. It's yeah, been that long time. Too. Yeah. yeah. Well, apparently it is mine now. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I let go. And what happened was my jacket now went up around my armpits and kind of cut off my, my throat. But my arms were so relieved to not be holding on to the, the chair anymore that um, I didn't care. I mean, I could get enough air to breathe. I knew I wasn't going to strangle in that moment, but it, I knew I couldn't last very long and I would probably black out. So I kind of wiggled my way through and fell to the ground and fully intended to do like a tuck and roll. I just <laughs> pictured this, but ah. I kind of forgot to tuck. And so uh, thankfully I had a helmet on or I would not be here. And um, yeah, gave myself a really major concussion and severe whiplash. And the reason I share it as my transformational story is really because I was launching this book. And in this book, I was talking about things that we do that make our life so much harder. And one of those things was the blame game, right? Wanting to, to give all the responsibility to the hill and say, those people should have been in the shack. They should have stopped the lift. They, you know, it's their fault. And, and blame them. And I, I couldn't do that because here I had this chapter in my book on why the blame game only robs you of your power and, and what you can do instead. Wow. <laughs> now, I can honestly say I didn't understand it at that time as well as I do now, but what an eye opener. That's amazing. You know, I often love, I ever since I started this spiritual path, it's so much fun because now I know that whenever I sign up for a class, it doesn't matter what it is, or I start writing a book or whatever, this program, <laughs> mm -hmm. for example, I'm going to find out exactly what I need to learn through random life experiences that are going to just come yes. up as a result of me signing up to learn or be part of a certain program or anything that a container i like to call it a container once you enter that container you're going to get all the lessons you need <laughs> it's like spirit's like absolutely Woo -woo, okay. she <laughs> wants to learn go. about not blaming people all right <laughs> yes <laughs> and what's really interesting to me too along with that is just when you think you have it all figured out like you really understand it something like this will happen that makes you go oh 10 20 30 levels deeper so that you now really get it. You really you know? get you it think, now. Yeah, you think, okay. And then later on, <laughs> you dig into it again and you realize, oh my gosh, there's even more. There's no end to it. It's amazing. Yeah, I think that we can unfold and unfold and unfold, you know, as long as we're in the body on the planet. <laughs> and, then we, depending and that's on, why we're here, right? Yeah, depending on your belief system, we keep unfolding into another life and another journey to learn whatever we want to learn next. So how fascinating. Yes. So I know that um, some of the work you do is around empowering women. So talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that because I've, I suspect that losing the blame game is part of what you're working with women on. Oh, absolutely. And, and like I say, it's morphed into something 
so much bigger. So really my book, Break Free of Parenting Pressures, was focused on helping um, mothers especially to understand what they were doing to make their life so much harder. Because we don't do that intentionally. We just don't always realize how much of our life we're living on autopilot and how much of it we're actually consciously, mindfully living, right? And it makes such a huge difference when we go off autopilot with some of the really big things in our life and instead focus our energy on what control do I have in this? And not to control it, but to recognize that we make things so much more difficult than they need to be, right? Yeah, so, the teachings I had around that had to do with, um, well, it was, it was after I left my marriage of 20 years and I was very much into the victim, right? So I was like, oh, he's just a jerk. It's all him. Like, yes. as soon as I leave, I'm going to find Prince Charming because I'm fabulous. There's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And about six months later, Spirit's like, yeah, that's nice. Here's a teacher. <laughs> you should start learning. And one of the first things that my first teacher taught us um, in his, from his book, Spirit Path, The Quest for Authenticity, um, mm -hmm. was about the victim, rescuer, perpetrator triangle. Okay. You know, and how if you're standing at any one of those corners, you are disempowered. Yes. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it, it took me a bit to recognize that if I ever wanted to, to ski again, to trust the people on the ski lift, I had to take full and complete responsibility for every single action I had done that led to that event. Mm. And some people go, well, why would you do that to yourself? Because I'm sitting there going, you know, I went and I bought a rip zone jacket. If I had bought just a regular jacket, it probably would have torn because the pressure, I mean, I wasn't going easy, <laughs> right? The pressure, but this jacket did not rip at all. That rip zone material is absolutely like metal. It's so strong. Well, I, I see a sponsor. That. I see a sponsor. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> when, I, when I do this presentation, I often will say, so if anyone knows anyone from rip zone, tell them to contact me. <laughs> I see a sponsor for sure. But, yeah. yeah. But I mean, that was, that was my responsibility that I had done that. The fact that I had tied the jacket around my waist, I even felt my intuition tell me, be very careful. And at the time I thought, well, careful for what? I mean, I'm just tying my jacket around my waist. There's nothing for it to get caught on. And I kind of argued with my intuition, which is wrong, but <laughs> we do that. We do that a lot. You know, I think that that's not, that's a familiar thing. I think most people, people in general, and especially women, I think, could go, I had that message and I completely ignored it. Yes, yes. And in this case, it was very gentle. It was just a be careful. It wasn't a you're going to get caught or, you know, anything. It was just be careful. But anyway, my point with the whole responsibility thing is the more I looked at these kinds of things, the more power it gave me back mm -hmm. because I realized I could do things differently. That it wasn't just by chance that the two people that were supposed to be manning the button in the shack weren't there, that they didn't do their job. And it allowed me to continue to go and ski and to, to trust that other people will do their job because it, it does make a huge difference when suddenly other people have let you down. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was one of the many, many things that I learned, I actually created a whole system called the tuck and roll system from it uh, to help people take back their power when a situation like this happens, because it is so very hard to do. Well, and I think, you know, one of the ways that uh, I learned how to take back my power was in my training. I was actually, the, uh, so I told you about the first teacher and I've had many teachers because you know, a little thick. I need a lot of help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I just enjoy it. It's so much fun. Mm -hmm. So I went away for my first class to uh, the Four Winds Society where I learned energy medicine. And Alberto Vialdo um, is the founder of that school. He's a prolific author, if you don't know him. Uh, Shaman Healer Sage. He's just a wonderful, uh, amazing guy. Anyway, the first class, he says, so everybody in this room, there's like 70 adults, you know, like me, like mid-20s mid to 60. He says, everybody in this room has mommy-daddy issues. Right. And here's how to get over that. 
you are a soul and you chose to come into this life and you chose those parents. Yes. You did it to yourself. So the next thing is to figure out why. And all of us are like, what a revelation. <laughs> like, you know, like, what? Yes. Yes. And that, that can be a very hard pill for some people to swallow. Um, but I think it's such an important one that we need to recognize that nothing is done to us. Things are done for us. And when you make that little shift, you're able to stop and go, okay, why? Why would that be for me? How does that help me? And when you sit down and look at it, there's always ways that you can go back and go, oh, yeah, if I hadn't done that, maybe I wouldn't have met this person or maybe I wouldn't have uh, gone and taken that self-defense course or maybe, I, you know, and there's all these things that changed your life and helped you in your journey. So it really does uh, make a huge difference when we take full responsibility for every part of our journey, including who our parents are and the situation we're born into. You know, and the first step in that, of course, is, is deciding, you know, I love this. I think it was Stephen Covey, but I'm not sure. But there was this metaphor, um, a teacher I studied way back when I was 20. So I've been aware of this for a while, you know, mm -hmm. about the horse and the rider, you know. And now I understand what that means is that the horse, you know, is the ego. You know, if we're letting the horse just decide where it wants to go, you know, we're not going to get anywhere. The rider really has to be the soul. It has to be the higher self steering, steering the horse, you know, where we want it to go. Mm -hmm. If you think about horses, they can be super stubborn and you know, like dig their heels in. They can bite at you. They can, you know, like. Two of my stories, my transition stories are horse stories. So I totally hear you. <laughs> <laughs> the horses are a great tool. I actually know somebody oh, they else are. uses them to teach, but. But yeah, it's kind of like that, that first step of, of swallowing that pill. Well, who's swallowing that pill? Right? Because it's not, when you, when you make that realization, who's the you that's making that realization? It's almost, I think it's like the part of you that's the higher self is waking up and going, oh yeah, I know that. Right. Because yeah. the ego doesn't know that. No. No. And that's exactly when I, when I talk about the blame game, that is the, the start of what I was just starting to realize at the time. I understood that it was ego that wanted to blame other people, to make excuses, to bring others down a notch. I understood ego was the, the human side of us. And I had already learned uh, prior to that, that there was this higher self and that I could have just simply ask the higher self to be in charge and the higher self would come in and be in charge and that I'd have to remind my ego to kind of stay out of the picture and I have to tell you that um, at one point maybe about 10 years after that I'm not sure how many I listened to Sonia Choquette she's a, a really gifted intuitive speaker author um, coach and she was talking about the ego and she said your ego is kind of like your dog Okay, you don't go home and kick the dog, right? You love it, you appreciate it, you train it, you give it boundaries, but you also don't let the dog run the show because like your horse story, it's not equipped to do it. But the ego is the part that we're most connected to, right? From the moment that we're born, we know our ego and we're getting to know our ego. We don't often even realize there's something else. There's this other piece of us and so if we let the ego make all those decisions and guide us in everything we do we're going to be making a lot of errors I often say the ego is actually more equipped to ruin things than to run things now that doesn't mean the ego is bad and we need to get rid of it because on the flip side the higher self or the soul or whatever you want to call it it really doesn't have any experience with living on earth. Mm. It has never experienced the pain and the, the uh, fear and all the things that can go on in a human body. So it's not fair to say, well, you know, the soul is connected, your higher self's connected to the divine. And, you know, it's, it's obviously got the bigger connection. It's the better one. Well, no, really, you need both of them if you truly want to have a human journey. And that's what we're here for. 
right? It's for that human journey. So my thing now, and, and certainly in Standing in Your Power, my second book, uh, and what I do now with people as I'm, I'm helping them, helping to empower women, is to help them recognize that you have these different aspects of yourself, and they're, it's like a teeter-totter, right? It's, it's not about the ego should run the show. It's not about the higher self should run the show. It's about finding kind of the balance between the two so that you can stay <laughs> as, as balanced as possible. And sometimes the ego is actually the better one, not necessarily to be in charge, but in that moment to process the things that are going on because they're human things that need to be processed. You know, that's so true. I, I've been, we talked about this before and I've been playing around with this myself in my own healings with clients and then my own personal healing, you know, cause we're always on an evolution of healing if we're stepping out as a leader, healer, right. coach type. So what's interesting is that you can process things at the spirit level, you know, you can process and understand and, you know, go to your Akashic records and do all this healing on yourself at the spiritual body and know what you're doing and you're healing all this, that, and the other thing. But really, you also have to heal at the body level. There's no escaping yes. the body. You can't just go, okay, I'm healed. No, it's still in there. Like you, you've got mm -hmm. to process through the emotional experience, through the body experience, um, the memories in the body. All of that's really so fascinating to me how the body is, is really infinitely wise in its construction. Yes, And it just, we're just now starting to figure out how that works. I mean, it's got its own divine intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have an aha moment that I'd love to share. Oh, yeah, please. Because <laughs> um, I had been calling in my higher self now for quite a long time, telling my ego to sit, you know, like my puppy dog, <laughs> sit. And anytime I felt myself getting really upset about something, I would remind my higher self to be in charge. And instantly, I mean, I had gotten to the point where it was just always there and I could just go into this space and, and take a more objective view and all these wonderful things. Well, not too long ago, just about a year and a half ago, I had a, a friend, a close friend, um, succumb to depression. And she took her own life, and it was hugely traumatic. It, um, as, I, as I sat there and processed it, I felt so many feelings about anger towards uh, the system. You know, the system really failed her. She tried so hard to do all the things that she was supposed to do, and the system failed her. And I, I felt so frustrated with people that, that didn't seem to support her and understand her the way I thought they could have. I felt hurt that she had done this and not said goodbye, because you can't always say goodbye when you're going to die, but in this case, she could have, you know. And so I had all these incredible feelings going through me. And what I did was exactly what I had been practicing for years. I would allow myself to feel to a certain point. And then when I started to get angry or want to have a pity party or go into this place of, of total despair, I'd call in my higher self. And I'd shift and everything would be fine. And I'd be able to, um, you know, talk to people. I'd be able to work. And I would be in a state of calm. And suddenly on, on the day of her celebration of life, I was in the shower and I was kind of dreading the upcoming celebration because um, there's so many mixed feelings. And all of a sudden, I was just hit with so much anger, with so much hurt. It just about crippled me. You know how you kind of, oh, over. And as I was feeling this, I went into this more objective place and I thought, this is really strange. Like, this is my ego, again, blaming people, wanting to hurt the people that I felt had hurt her. Like, this was just really foreign to me to even go here anymore. And uh, all of a sudden, I had this knowing. And the knowing was exactly what you just said. It was this sense of the ego is the only one grieving, honey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the higher self doesn't grieve. The higher self just saw this as one more transition from living to dead. It, it's not a big deal to the higher self. It hasn't lost anything. But your ego is grieving. And the grieving process has to be done in your ego state. And I know that might sound really simple to a lot of people listening. But for me, this was just this huge, oh. Right. Yeah. That's what spiritual bypass is. Yeah. Spiritual
spiritual bypass is, oh, this is uncomfortable being human in a body. I'll just go up into my spirit where everything yeah. is fine and abstract and I have that awareness. And so I can escape there and I can know that this is just a virtual reality and I don't have to feel it. Exactly. But be happy all the time. Exactly. But I have brought <laughs> myself to this place thinking that that's where that was the right place. That that's ascension. That's my higher self in charge. But that's not ascension. I realized no. it's, it's ascension is actually being able to merge the physical human experience with the divine spiritual being yes. so that we fully experience life on this plane. Yes. And, and, and then we maintain our awareness. We know the, the multi-dimensions of reality. We're aware of that. And then we can bring that through us here to this plane. And I think I told you I had, where I talked to you that day that I had some epiphany where I realized, <laughs> oh, wait a second. We're, gonna, we're merging the spiritual body down into the physical body, really securing it down in the hips and being fully present. And when we do that, we can open a channel for spirit, that divine flow to come through us and to create a vibration into this third dimensional plane of love. And love is what the world needs now. Yes. And it needs that high vibration love, not that clutchy, codependent, grasping, romantic attachment love. Mm -hmm. It needs that high vibration, pure love that only a spirit, a, a spiritual being, a divine being fully inhabiting its physical matter, open heart channel, clear channel, as my um, teacher Gary Starnes likes to call it, you know, the hollow bone, mm -hmm. only the hollow bone can channel <coughs> spirit in the pureness of it. And that's the vibration this plane needs right now. We're, we're hungry and thirsty and starving for it. Yes. And yet I think that um, every person can do it from their own starting point. So for some people, that is very simply going to be recognizing that, huh, there's more to me than just me. <laughs> there's this higher self and calling in their higher mm -hmm. self. And then the next person might be ready to actually call in their higher self when they're in a really difficult situation and, and they can see that their ego is getting aroused and really getting upset. And they, you know, so they advance through that. And then the next person might be able to go into most things in that Zen state right and and be very objective when they do feel like they're getting upset about something they're able to go into the objective and look and go oh my gosh like what am i doing here why am i getting so upset about it what is it about this that i need to learn or whatever right they're able to do all of those pieces and at some point you get to that level where you're going okay i can be i can be a container of love i can bring in that vibrational energy and and just shoot it out through my heart Heart all around me to the people and actually have it make a difference and so to me it's important that people know there's so many different steps you don't just jump right into the no. okay here I am. I'm gonna be love right now <laughs> exactly. and then think oh I, I just I can't do this I don't know how to do this it's, it's not for me you it's know. been taking you know I gotta say like to get to this place and this understanding that I have now has been like complete immersion in my spiritual work for, you know, I don't know, the last six years, like mm -hmm. without f stopping, like it never stops. I'm always on it. I'm fascinated by it. So I can't, I never, like I, I eat, breathe, sleep, the spiritual journey. <laughs> yes. And once you know, you know, so it's hard to just, you know, say, okay, I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to go out there and be me and I'm going to, you know, I'm be to judgy do that. And I, <laughs> it's, yeah, it I can't happen. do it anymore. I want to yeah. sometimes. You know, yeah. I also want to say, like, what was the first, as you were talking about that, I was really feeling like, oh, yeah, let's back up a few thousand steps. Like, what, where, what did I start? I started by asking for, for help. I realized this, I don't know, this mechanism, these higher selves, this spiritual, whatever this is, this conscious, consciousness that guides yes. us mm -hmm. is super respectful. And yes. it, it does not intrude. If you want to live your whole life in ego, you are blessed to do it. It's fine. Like you can go right ahead. It, there's yeah. nothing's going to stop you. Absolutely. You're, it's your free will. You can do that. 
You're, yes. you're loved so much that you can do that. You don't even have to acknowledge the creator, nothing. And you can even go, um, like it, it's, it's not always necessarily just a, um, an ego thing or anything that you, like if you want to tune out to these kinds of things, you can even take it a step further. And honestly, I forgot what I was going to say. So oh. <laughs> I'm thinking, what was I going to share? What was I going to, well, that's not even, not important. <laughs> it It'll come back if it was. It you will. know, what's fascinating <laughs> is that um, once you ask for help, you know, I remember my darkest my darkest time. I mean, I had cheated on my husband. It was very vulnerable. Um, you know, I just felt desperate. I was, I couldn't get out of my head, out of the thought tunnels, out of the mazes, the self-judgment, the guilt, the, all of that stuff. I just couldn't escape it. And I was just beating myself up relentlessly over it. And at one point, I remember I was so desperate. It was almost like that Melissa Gilbert on the floor, you know, eat, pray, love thing. And I, I got on the floor. I just sat, I just kneeled and I was like, please help me, God. I mean, I was bawling and I'm like, please help me, like big racking sobs. And like all of a sudden, I just like, oh, the tears stopped. It's like God just reached in and like turned off the spigot. It's like, hmm, we're done with that. I'm like, wow. And I felt peaceful and, you know, and I think that that was when I realized, oh, there is something here that's helping me. I don't know what it is. I didn't have any re religious training or anything like that. So I had to kind of figure this out for myself. But I think that from there, you can start coordinating. But, you know, it's really your choice as the personality, I like to call it, you know, as the personality, the human being. It's our choice to ask for help. It's our choice how much and how often we want to include our higher self in this journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, it, it also isn't always that. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that funny? Okay, so uh, for whatever reason, higher self does not want me to share this right now. This is, doesn't happen to me, but I'm I not going to share it. I was going to make a comment about the free will and how it's not always even just that. But whatever that comment is, gone. Twice, two times. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, okay people, this is spirit at work. Isn't yes. that fascinating? Right through me. Oh, right. and now I remember what it is. So now it's going to allow me to share. And okay. here's what I wanted to say: Your soul group chose you. It chose you to come here right now in this time for a reason. But it doesn't see things as successful or failures, right? So it doesn't look at your life and go, oh, they didn't get from here to here, so therefore that was a failure. They see every single little thing you do as a success. So even if you don't um, push aside free will a little bit and say, hey, give me some help, because maybe you do want to go it alone. That's okay. It's still a successful journey. And that's what makes it so neat, because we're all so unique. We're all so special. We've all got these situations that are, are a little bit different than everyone else's, and we can do it our own way. And our cheering section is still there going, yes, she's doing it. That's what I wanted to share. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. I'm glad you probably got that out. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what's interesting too uh, on my journey. Now, I have to say, I just this caveat. My parents were, had lots of spiritual discussion around the table. It was the 70s, okay? So my dad had gone and gotten like a past life regression and talked about it openly and transitioning wow. between lives. And so I, that's how I was raised. So that, that little seed got planted that that's possible for me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really have any experience of that though at all. Like I was in my, my life. As a matter of fact, I was starting to kind of go into that um, before my life exploded. I was starting to explore like, hey, I want to know who I was before and I want to do these past life things. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it didn't work. I saw nothing, like nothing happened. And I was so frustrated. And, I'm, and I've told this story in the show before, but I'll just say it again in case you're listeners. So I'm like riding my bike in a recumbent bike and I'm just mad because this person sucked. And I'm like, she's just a sucky hypnotist. I'll just find the best one. I'm going to look on Oprah, you know, like, right, right. and all of a sudden this voice, like I've, this has never happened to me since or before this voice, this big male voice boomed in my head. You have a life, live it. Hmm. I'm like looking around like what is that holy cow yeah. and I was like 
okay, I guess I'm not going to look at that now. And literally within a few weeks of that, I blew my life up. <laughs> like, wow. Like, yeah. everything. <laughs> you know, like disaster. Yes. But it was the burning. It was like Kali came in and just, uh, you know, reshaped my life, you know, came, burned down the forest. And that's apparently how you grow a new one. You burn the forest down and then you let the new one grow back. And that's what I needed to do. And that's a part I think I was avoiding by spiritual bypassing into my past lives without knowing that I was really doing that. At some level, I think my ego knew, oh, this is the part we're going to do some really bad stuff. And I really don't want to do that. So how about we go explore past lives instead? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because this is going to be awkward and uncomfortable, and who wants to go there? And I don't want to go there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, that's the part that's so fun. Tell us a little bit about this. I know you've shared this experience <clears throat> where you think it's going to be horrible. Like, you're like, oh, God, I don't want to do You have so much resistance. Like, I don't want to go do this thing. It's awful. It's terrible. I'm resisting it. I don't, I just, you know, my pendulum's saying no, you know, like, you know, all those things. <laughs> And then you go and do it and it's like, it is difficult, but you get through it and it's amazing. Like you, mm. it's the best thing that ever happened. I know that's happened for you. Mm. So many times. <laughs> I mean, which, which one do you choose? I think for whatever reason, the one that's coming to me right now was um, breaking up with my boyfriend back when I was, I was a young adult. I was I think 16 when I met him and I was 19 when I broke up with him and I was marrying him and you know I just I had it all figured out and he was kind of abusive but at the time I wasn't a social worker and I didn't really know what abuse was so uh, this was a whole new idea to me and he just yeah I, I just felt like I couldn't live without him right he was the first guy to really I felt see me and to love me for who I was. And for that, Casey happens to be listening to your show, I thank him because, you know, it, it really helped me to connect with who I am. But breaking up with him, the idea of living life without him, it, it just felt like I, I can't. I can't do it. I would rather stay in this little bit of unhappiness with some problems on the side, a little bit of alcohol and drugs coming into the picture, you know, and I'd, I'd rather live there than try to to do this and actually sever the breakup so or sever the relationship but I did and it was amazing to me like as soon as I actually made the decision that I'm I'm worth more than this or I'm worth investing in me and that means I have to say goodbye to him and as soon as I did that and walked away I told my mom that was a hard point I cried a little bit when I told my mom and after that it was like huh it was done and I felt so free and I felt so good and I never at any point felt like going back which was amazing because we had broken up like 20 times and gotten back together and <laughs> broken up and gotten back together and this time it was just done it was just so totally done and I just felt so good about it and I mean I, I can't say I've never looked back because I honestly have looked back and thought about it and thanked him for what he taught me and you know had all those pieces uh, come up for me but I never thought with regret, if only, if only I could have stayed instead. So, I think that's really beautiful. It's like, it's a really good message about the spiritual journey is to, when you notice yourself in resistance and your pendulum is telling you no or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a pendulum then. I have but to I, say that. <laughs> I mean, but I'm just saying, you know, your, yeah, guidance, oh, I, I hear you. your guidance is saying no. And mm -hmm. you just, but you, but you keep asking, that's a sign. Like, it's like, okay, I keep trying to do this. Maybe there's something here on the other side that I need to look at, you know? Right. <laughs> and then we, I think that what happens is that we, especially as women, we, we have the intuition and then we go into doubt. We go into self-doubt mm -hmm. and questioning it and it doesn't make sense. And why would I do that? And Yes. And then we feel and, bad because it might hurt somebody because we're a pleaser and we don't want to do that. Yes. And give me proof. Give me proof before I do it because I really don't want to look like a fool on this one. You know? And I remember yeah. Alberto in one of the classes, I think I asked him, um, well, how do you know? How do you know like the right thing and how do you let it go? And he's like, 
You know, the problem, Carrie, is that you can't let things go. The reason you know, I was having problems manifesting, because I'm a really good manifester, but for a little while, it was a little challenging. Right. And the reason why is because I hold on to it. Yes. And he said, that's because you're controlling. That's because you think that no one's going to do it for you. You think that you have to do it. And this is the piece I wanted to bring in. He said, you have to leap into the void with faith mm. before you know that the help is going to be there. Yes. Yes. You have to trust that it's there. <laughs> Trusting is so hard for us. If, if my journal, if I had to go through it and pick out the word that comes up the most, it'll be trust with a capital T yeah. because I'm constantly being reminded that you need to trust. And I know I'm supported. I know I am. And, you know, everything goes along when things are going good. I feel it so fully and totally. And I think, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then something happens and I stop and it's like, oh, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Well, why did that happen? And it can be as simple as you, you just about the pendulum, but it can be as simple as my pendulum telling me something without a doubt and then it being wrong because I've asked the wrong question or put, I've, you know, used free will, I've changed things, whatever the reason is, it doesn't matter. And I'll think, well, that's not right. That's not fair. <laughs> it's supposed to be 100% accurate. <laughs> there's, yes. no, there's no 100% accurate. There isn't. And you know, I'm always telling my clients this, you can't do it wrong. It's your life. You are the only person who can live your life. You cannot do it wrong. You can make it harder for you. You can struggle way more than you need to, but you can't do it wrong. And when you really, really understand that and see yourself as a whole complete thing, not something that's broken or needs fixing or, you know, has a dent here and there, but see yourself as complete, then you start to recognize that, you know, anything I do is like icing on the cake. It's a little bit more than what it might have been. But the cake is still me and I'm still good. And I don't like to use that analogy because I'm gluten intolerant, but <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the point is that you're already enough. You really, really are. And you can't do it wrong. And when you accept that, it can change things for you. I love that message. And I will say that that is the message I've been getting lately because for a while on my journey, once because I was living in ego, right? I was completely driven by my personality. Then I blew up my life. And then I recognized I needed to admit that I was wrong about a few things and I needed some right. help, <laughs> you know, so I opened for guidance. I'm like, okay, help me, help me, help me. And for a long time, I was in that help me, help me, help me, help me decide what to do. Help me, what's the highest path? What's the good decision? What's the dot, the dot? And so I would yes. check, 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 check. And then recently, like, I don't know, in the last eight months, the new thing is, what do you want? Yes. My guys are like, <laughs> yes, I've been there. <laughs> what do you want, Carrie? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I don't want to make the decision. Just tell me. What tell me mean? what I'm supposed to do. I want to do the right thing. They're yeah. like, what do you want? Yeah. Because <sighs> you can't do it wrong. I mean, every card reading I do, every, it's like, oh, man. I thought I had a plan. What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> yes. So and that is going with the flow, right? Yeah. I mean, first we do have to surrender. Then we have to be willing to, oh, well, we have to have faith, but then we have to be willing to go with the flow. And that going with the flow is so hard because that's where trust comes in. Like, what if there's rapids around the corner? I don't want to knowingly go into rapids without having my life vest and my whatever <laughs> emergency equipment. That would be irresponsible. And so we start trying to put all this practical logic into why we need to know. But if you truly want to go with the flow, and if you're truly willing to stop resisting and surrender, then you have to be willing to just flow along and trust that whatever happens, you'll make it through. Not an easy task, but that's part of the experience, right? Yeah. And I think that also um, realizing that all those experiences along the way are part of the glory of being a human. It's part of your hero's yes. journey. The, the scars and the wounds and the, and the, you know, like the good, I mean, that makes a good story. If you didn't have that, like if you didn't have your story of falling from your chairlift, no matter how terrifying it was at the time, 
but look how that's contributed. Look how many lessons you got from it. Look how many good stories you get to tell about it. I mean, that's the good stuff. I mean, it's fun that's, to say I went home every day after work and nothing ever eventful happened and I ate my dinner and it was fabulous. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. I always tell people that, uh, think about it, if you're just going on a, a raft down a very smooth river, about, say, day two, maybe day three, you're going to be sitting there going, okay, I need something. Like, have a fish jump, something, because <laughs> <laughs> this is not fun. Like, we need some changes. We need rapids. We need things to keep us going. And, and that's one of the really hard parts for us right now is, is we're learning so much about stress, and the message out there is get rid of all the stress in your life. But really, stress is a very important motivator for us. And so it's not about getting rid of all stress. It's about recognizing what you can control and can't so that you're able to perceive the stress in a way that helps to motivate you but isn't hurting your health. And so again, it's back on that teeter-totter. I tell you, we spent a lot of time there. Back on the teeter-totter, personality <laughs> and spirit. Yes. So tell me, I know you have a free offer for us. So tell us a little bit about your free offer. Well, I have, um, I have a stress package, and I, so I, I'm never certain what people <laughs> might be interested in, but the fact that stress just came up, um, I have a package on my website called Stress Less, Live More, and it really is a book about, uh, an e-book, so it's very short, but it is about giving you tools and ideas for, all right, how do I take stock of how much stress is affecting me in a negative way? And then how do I start changing that in my life? Because it's such a concrete, important part of our life. And uh, yeah, so it's on my website and I can certainly give you the link as well. And we can share that and people can just enjoy. Awesome. That is great. How perfect, right? It just wrapped right in. I it love did. when that happens. It's yeah. Like, I, <laughs> When we started the broadcast, I told her, we're just going to let the conversation go where it needs to go. And it always wraps back up in a perfect place. And you guys just witnessed it. That's spirit and synchronicity. It's there perfect. you go. And two people that are willing to trust, even when they cannot find the words. <laughs> even when they don't. What, where did it go? How come you took it away? What's happening? Okay. We're here. We got the message. Yes. So any last words you have for the audience or anything else you want to share? Just really, um, I'd like to reiterate what I already said. You are perfect exactly as you are. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It doesn't mean you won't make mistakes. We do. That's how we grow. That's how we learn. Those are the rapids, right? So it's just about really, really recognizing that this journey is your opportunity to experience something that only you can make happen. And so the more you believe in yourself and say, you know, I just really want to embrace this life fully, the more you're going to get from it. And that's, that's my wish for you is that you lead a vibrant, powerful life and know that it can be as extraordinary as you want it to be. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. And thank everybody for being here. I always end with kisses. So I'm going to give you guys kisses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's and we'll beautiful. See you guys next week. <laughs> Bye.